Good morning and welcome. My name is James Galbraith. I'm the chair of the Board of Economists for Peace and Security, and I would like to welcome you to this EPS Bernard Schwartz Symposium entitled A Strategic Policy, Investment, Social Security, and Economic Recovery. I would like, as we begin, to thank, as always, our uh, partners at the New America Foundation who helped very much with the logistical underpinnings and uh, publicity for the, this symposium, and the uh, Ronald Reagan uh, Building an International Trade Center uh, for uh, making this marvelous facility available to us. I would also like to thank, uh, of course, uh, Bernard Schwartz, uh, for his uh, strong support and uh, for our efforts over several years now in framing economic policy questions uh, in these symposia. As, I, as we begin this morning, I'm tempted to say that a specter is haunting Washington. It is the specter of the Bowles-Simpson Deficit Reduction Commission meeting behind closed doors and occasionally dropping hints of the debate to come after the midterm elections. The specter of a wave of demands for cuts in Social Security and Medicare as a kind of sacrifice to the, on the altar of fiscal responsibility. In other words, an argument that is gathering force to the effect that such are the problems of the federal fisc, of the public budget deficit, and the national debt, that we need to act now in order to make severe cuts in what remains of the American social safety net. No one anymore uses the word privatization, but behind this campaign there is, in fact, the same forces that were calling for the privatization of these programs just a few years ago. Today, the program is buttressed by dire warnings of a fiscal doomsday, and these are anchored in the projections of highly reputable authority. The Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan and highly respected institution. The question facing us this morning is whether this agenda really meets the economic crisis that still faces the United States and the American people, and whether it serves the larger public purpose. And if not, and I believe the answer is, is that it does not, most emphatically that it does not, then the question facing us is what should be our priorities in setting a new direction for economic policy uh, in the United States in the years ahead? A strategic direction, uh, as we emphasize in the title of the symposium, a strategic direction that can help, in a sense, set a path for the redevelopment of our economy, for the resumption of economic growth, and above all, for the creation of jobs and tackling our vast and unsolved problem of unemployment. So with that in mind, uh, we've asked, uh, we've organized three panels this morning uh, around three separate aspects of these, this issue. The first is to 
examine what is the actual state of our economy, what is the outlook, what are the true problems, and how these may be distinguished from issues which are more or less contrived in the service of an ulterior agenda. The second panel will ask the question, what is the true record of Social Security and Medicare? What is their actual function in our economy? Can they be sustained? Should they be sustained as they are or even expanded in order to serve the purposes of uh, stabilization and to serve a role in uh, a successful economic strategy going forward? And the third panel will look at how these issues fit into a larger picture of the need for an economic strategy that fosters economic and national security in the broadest sense of the term. In other words, what are the uh, true priorities that we should be pursuing as a matter of economic strategy going forward? I will have considerably more to say on these subjects later on in the morning, but what I'd like to do now is to invite the first panel to come up, and that panel will be chaired by the Vice Chair of, the, of Economists for Peace and Security, Richard Kaufman, my longtime colleague and former General Counsel of the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I want to say a few words amplifying uh, the opening remarks um, uh, uh, that um, James Galbraith just gave us uh, as they relate to um, the deficit. Our topic, the economy and the budget, that is the topic of this panel, under the present circumstances leads inevitably to deficit spending. But do deficits really matter? How and when do they matter? Do they matter in different ways at different times in the economic cycle? Are present trends leading towards crippling deficits? How can deficits be usefully employed now and over the long term to reduce unemployment and achieve sustained economic growth? These are some of the questions that might be addressed in a reasoned debate and discussion about economic policy. I'm not sure that recent debate is present is possible at the present time of uh, the um, uh, forthcoming the um, oncoming elections, which used to be described as the silly season, but the silly season started a little earlier uh, this season, this uh, cycle. What passes for debate and discussion today is far from reason. Instead, especially in conservative circles, one's attitude about deficits has become the purity test of our time. Conservatives, as presently defined, have demonized deficits as necessarily a product of reckless spending and a plot to destroy America as we know it. Liberals and progressives suspect, with good reason, that the deficit hysteria is being used to support a not-so-secret agenda to prepare the ground for a frontal assault, as James Galbraith mentioned, uh, again, Social Security and Medicare. Our panelists are well qualified to discuss these matters. There are short biography, biographies about each of them in the folders that have been distributed. And in the interest of time, I would forego the usual introductions and proceed with our first speaker, Thomas Paley of the New America Foundation. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, the organizers have told me that I have only eight minutes and that the chair has teeth. So uh, the one thing I always like to do when I give a talk is to make sure that I deliver my main message. Uh, and there you have it. Uh, fiscal austerity is a trap. It is a trap 
that risks sabotaging growth, and it's also a trap that risks producing self-fulfilling budget difficulties. That, that is the message. And if you like what I have to say in the rest of my talk, there is also a paper available on the New America website at www.newamerica.com, I think, dot, dot, dot net. Yeah, there we go. Now, the US economy is struggling to escape the deepest recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, let's get one thing clear here. This recession is due to a massive failure within the private sector. Yet many in Washington and in the policy establishment here are back to arguing that government is the problem and that we need fiscal austerity. This is a case, to quote Yogi Berra, of deja vu all over again. The fiscal austerity agenda is a Washington perennial. It was the wrong economic agenda before the crisis, and it's the even more the wrong agenda now. Our challenge is therefore twofold. We need to discredit the fiscal austerity agenda, and we need to create support for a new economic agenda that includes public investment. Larry Summers called for timely, targeted, and temporary fiscal stimulus. He was wrong not for the first time. <laughs> what we need is substantial, smart, and sustained fiscal stimulus. Now, a fir the first critical challenge I referred to is to discredit the fiscal austerity agenda. Here's a figure that shows average total G7 government debt as a percentage of GDP. It's actually an IMF chart. Now, the IMF, when they focus on this, focus at the end of the, the, the chart, and you do see that total debt has increased very significantly after the financial crisis. But as usual with the IMF, they miss what is really important in this picture. Something happened in the late 1970s and early 1980s that started to reverse and change structurally our budget outcomes around the entire G7 and it includes the US, though the pattern in which these developments took place does vary a little from country to country. It was not the oil shock. It was the turn to neoliberal policy that increased unemployment, lowered growth, lowered taxes, and above all, raised interest rates. That is absolutely critical. Because to me, it means we will not fix our budget challenges until we reverse neoliberal policy. And the problem is that we are stuck in what a friend of mine, Stefan Schulmeister, calls the neoliberal two-step. The two-step works as follows. Step one is you adopt neoliberal economic policy and create a problem. Step two is then you claim we need more neoliberal policy to solve the problem. It really is that simple. That is exactly what's going on with the budget deficit debate in this talk about taxes. Irresponsible tax policy creates huge budget deficits, then we need more irresponsible tax policy to get out of it. It's the same when we talk about regulation. Irresponsible re regulation and lack of regulation created a problem. So guess what? A lot of uh, the Congress says we need less regulation, more of that irresponsible stuff. The same on labor market policy. The same on trade policy. The same across the board with Federal Reserve policy. You look everywhere you go and you see the imprint of the neoliberal two-step. And we have to get that message across here. We have to discredit neoliberal policy because we cannot fix these problems until we abandon neoliberal policy and restore a pro-people shared prosperity policy. But that's really very tough. And it's tough because a lot of Democrats, a lot of the media, a lot of voters, and almost the entire economics profession believe in neoliberal economics in one form or another. Now, I'm going to argue now for three reasons why we need sustained deficit finance fiscal policy. Reason number one is we still need stimulus, and it's not a word I like because it does cast too short term a shadow. We need stimulus to jumpstart the recovery. We have a shortfall of private sector demand, and in that situation, go the government should step in and plug the shortfall to prevent a deeper recession. We have not yet established recovery, 
And that means there is a very great danger that fiscal austerity now could trigger the feared double dip recession. And here, as many commentators have mentioned, history does hold lessons. Back in 1937, the Roosevelt administration succumbed to political pressure for deficit reduction, and guess what happened? There was a second dip or a second recession in the midst of the Great Depression. Reason number two that we need sustained deficit finance fiscal policy is to facilitate private sector deleveraging. The private sector is over indebted. That means it needs to deleverage. The result, and this is particularly in the household sector, has been a massive increase in saving that has resulted in far more saving far greater than investment demand. This is what economist Richard Koo calls a balance sheet recession. When, when households save to restore their balance sheets, causing a collapse of private sector demand. In this case, the private sector must find a taker for its savings. If it does not find a taker, demand and income will contract further, which will increase unemployment, which will actually reduce saving and therefore extend the duration of the deleveraging process. The role of government in this type of economic situation is to run deficits, to take the private sector's excess savings and then rebuild the private sector's balance sheets by supplying bonds and spending those savings. That is the way to accelerate the escape from a balance sheet recession. Reason number three why we need sustained deficit fis finance fiscal policy is to spur economic growth. The old growth model that we've lived with this past 20, uh, 25 years was based on debt and asset price inflation, and it is clearly broken. It just doesn't work. That raises the question of where will growth come from? We need a new growth model, and deficit finance public investment can play a very important role in this new growth model. We know that public investment has a high rate of return. And after 30 years of low public investment, we have the need and the opportunity. We can create a virtuous circle of growth where deficit financed public investment increases economic growth, which in then creates the fiscal space to meet, to either fund more, de to, to reduce budget deficits and to keep funding that public investment. The fiscal austerity agenda risks the exact, exact opposite. It will create a vicious circle, the reverse logic, where we cut deficits and public investment now, that lowers growth and then tightens the fiscal noose. This is a critical message we need to get across to people. So let me conclude. The evidence is clear. Fiscal stimulus has already created jobs and already helped reduce the scale of, the, uh, of job loss. We must contest this situation where economists can say anything, where the media can report anything. It unhinges our discourse. The evidence on this is absolutely clear. The budget deficit now is also helping us through the deleveraging cycle, through the process I described. And we have a public investment gap. We know that public investment can have a high rate of return, and we know it can help spur growth. I don't have the time now, but later today, Jamie Gil Gilbraith will show that we have the fiscal space to s pursue this substantial, smart, sustained, deficit-financed public investment agenda. But again, I come back to the point I started with. I must emphasize that smart fiscal policy is not going to be enough. The budget deficit is significantly determined by economic performance. If we don't abandon neoliberal policy, which includes the terrible neoliberal pol fiscal policies of the last 25 years, the economy will underperform. And then, eventually, we will get stuck in a true fiscal crisis. So let's begin by getting fiscal policy right, but we must also realize we have to fix the problems of corporate globalization, we have to fix the problems of a corporate-inspired deregulation agenda, we have to fix the weakness in the American labor market, and we have to fix Federal Reserve policy making. That is where the Obama administration and many Democrats still have a lot of learning to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And uh, we'll now hear from Heather Boucher.
Well, good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I can see that this is going to be a war of alliteration, um, and it's fantastic to, to follow Tom. Uh, I was also thinking about the timely, targeted, and temporary uh, mantra that when I was working on the Hill a couple of years ago and we were talking about that stimulus, if I heard that phrase one time, I heard it like 3,000 times from people who had no idea really what it meant, but it, it stuck in their heads. Um, I like substantial, smart, and sustained, but this morning and this p past week, I was thinking of a clear, comprehensible, and credible. And so, um, but I'll get I'll get to that at the end. Um, let the alliteration go on. Um, so, I want to sort of uh, you know, it, it's great to follow Tom because he said a lot of the things that I don't have to say. So I'm going to reference. It. I mean, all of the sort of the laying out of the problem is already clear. You know, we clearly have an, an, output, an, an output gap here in the U.S. economy, and as a labor economist, what I focus on uh, most each and every day is the massive number of unemployed folks we have and the need to, to do more to get those people back to work and to fill in that output gap. One of the things um, that I find striking is um, while we're having the de these debates about deficits and tax cuts here in Washington, Month after month, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is a membership organization of small businesses in the United States, puts out a survey, the front page of which they talk about how we need tax cuts. When you actually look at what their members keep saying month after month after month, is that they don't have enough sales. That is their major concern. They're not seeing customers come through the door. And I think that that is one of sort of the nicest, crispest pieces of evidence that you can point to, especially for policymakers who, who claim to really care about small businesses, that we have this massive output gap. So the question is, how can we fill it? How can we get back to full employment within this climate where we are concerned about deficits and where the mantra um, is now fast becoming uh, concerns about tax cuts? So I want to start uh, my comments this morning in my brief um, eight minutes by taking a few minutes to sort of remember how we got to this particular moment, and then I want to go back a little bit further in history. So back in 2008, when we elected President Obama, um, you know, unemployment was already starting to rise. We were orders, already seeing output falling. And um, over the transition, before he actually even took office, Christina Romer, who became, of course, his, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, and Jared Bernstein, put together a paper that laid out the administration's um, view, what would become their view on what was going to happen. And um, they did this over the Christmas holiday. I found it very annoying because that meant over the Christmas holiday I had to read it and comment on it, but I also felt bad for them that, you know, here they were, they don't even have their jobs yet, they're not even being paid, and they're doing this economic modeling for the country. And uh, by the time that report was released, it was already too optimistic. Unemployment was already clearly going higher than what they had forecasted. Um, and uh, they estimated that in the absence of stimulus, that we would lose about five to six million jobs. Of course, we lost over eight million jobs over the course of the Great Recession, um, and unemployment went far higher than they had uh, predicted. Now, that model was formed the basis of the various uh, policy proposals that the administration looked at that January and that, that winter. And the, sto the story is that Christina Romer had run a, a number of simulations on how much we needed to do to get the economy back on track, three of them. Uh, one, a, a recovery package of about $600 billion, one for about $800 billion, and one for $1.2 trillion. Now, of course, Christina Romer was, in my view at least, not really known as some radical lefty economist before she took this job at the White House. Um, but based on her analysis and her understanding of the Great Depression and work that she'd done, she came to the conclusion that it was the $1.2 trillion package that we needed to fill in a $2 trillion output gap. As we now know, however, that proposal really never made it um, to the president's ear. That was not a part of the conversation that um, the, the, the folks in the White House had as they were trying to figure out what to do. Why? Right? Why wasn't the one, even though we knew we had this output gap, we could see the, the labor market falling off a cliff, why weren't we talking about it? Well, the three answers that have been given are, number one, Congress. Congress would not uh, be able, the sticker shock of $1.2 trillion would just make everybody fall flat on their back, and there was no way that that was going to go through Congress. That's probably a fair assessment. 
government bureaucracy. How could we spend $1.2 trillion? And we see now, as the recovery dollars have flowed through the economy, that that actually is a real concern. How fast can government, you know, uh, uh, pick up and throw that much money out into the economy in a way that's smart and is um, targeted at, at growth? And the third issue, of course, that uh, Dr. Summers brought up at that time was deficits and the concern that we would be here now with these deficits and that would have impacts on the bond market, which, of course, we haven't seen in the, 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 way that, uh, in the negative way that we would think. Now, I want to be clear that the recovery package and the money that we've spent that has, that has helped create the deficit has been important for the economy. But if clearly we haven't done enough, and um, I'm going to an event uh, that's actually starting right now, but later this afternoon with a bunch of economists talking about all the things that we need to do to create jobs. And of course, most of them, and you look at those lists of things that we need to do, the kinds of things that Tom alluded to, the kinds of things that um, we talk about here in Washington every day, investments in infrastructure, investments in job creation, direct job creation, making sure that we're maintaining demand by getting those unemployment benefits out into the economy. We spent over $75 billion on benefits for just the longer-term unemployed last year. That alone uh, sort of, I think, makes Congress feel a little nauseous in terms of just how much money we're having to spend. But all of those require that we continue to deficit spend. But I think that the arguments that we had at the end of 2008 and early 2009 that set the framework for, for wh how we got from there to here, the fact that we didn't put a package out that was big enough to begin with, and that we weren't able to communicate to the American public effectively in any way, shape, or form that we were doing something, but we were only going half there. And so I want to touch back on something Tom said, which is this idea about the neoliberal two-step, right? There is this notion that the neoliberals tell us, well, we're doing these things, but we didn't do enough of them, so we need to do more. Well, that's actually the exact same situation that we're in, right? I was talking to a group of college kids last night, so here's the analogy I use, so bear with me, right? It's like you threw a party, right? But your dad, you know, you threw a party for 100 people, and you wanted to buy enough soda pop for everybody, right? And you knew you were going to need about $200 to do that. But your dad only gave you $100 for the party, so you're only enough, able to buy enough soda pop for half the people. So essentially, you threw a really crappy party, but it wasn't your fault. It was because you didn't actually funnel enough, enough resources to actually do what you needed to do to fill in that gap. But that isn't the conversation that we're having now because nobody but those of us in this room actually understand that that's what's going on. So here I come back um, to the notion of clear, comprehensible, and credible. And this is the moment where I often think of people like my mom, right, who's a good person, typically votes Democratic, not an economist, doesn't get it. You can't explain to her why we can have deficits from now until as far as the eye can see, and that that won't have make something bad happen to the economy. It just, it doesn't, it, you're not connect, you can't connect with people with that message. So as much as I completely agree with Tom, and I completely agree that we need to spend, right? I mean, I could bore you for hours with all the things that we need to do to get people back to work and how we need to continue to deficit spend and the importance of Social Security and, and Medicare. We're not going to be able to do anything until we get to a place where the fact that Congress can't comprehend that because the public can't comprehend that uh, isn't our main uh, sticking point. And so here I want to take the last of my couple of minutes, which hopefully I still have a couple left, um, to, to try to argue that I think we actually lost this debate a decade ago um, or even longer, and we are still sort of dealing with the aftershocks of it. The last time we had a surplus, or projected surplus, was in the, you know, the end of the Clinton era. And then the national conversation became what to do with that surplus, and the answer was give it to rich people because they're the ones that create jobs. Now we all know that that didn't work. We gave massive tax cuts to the richest people in this country, and what that led to was a decade of McMansions and Hummers, the lowest investment growth in the post-World War II period, and the lowest growth in employment that we've seen in any economic recovery. The rich people didn't invest because basically you gave money to people like Paris Hilton, and no diss on her, but didn't really create jobs. It wasn't targeted. Um, but the American public doesn't understand that disconnect. So now we're having a debate about tax cuts for the wealthy, and what the Republicans keep wanting to say is that, that is, those are tax cuts for small business owners. Now, there's facts, and we can have that argument, um, and we often do, but 
I would like to encourage us today to think about how we're going to communicate with people like my mom and every, every other sort of normal person I talk to when I get out of DC and talk to folks around the country who just can't wrap their head around the fact that we need these deficits because the way that they have been told for 10, 20, 30 years that the economy works is that what gets our economy going is rich people investing and that they've got to cut costs and cut wages. Now, back in the Great Depression, we passed all these great things that we're always pointing back to, the Social Security Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act. The debate was different. They raised the minimum wage because people understood that workers bought stuff. That link isn't there for most people these days. So that is my sort of challenge to you as we're thinking about the, the deficit. How do we reshape that conversation so that people understand that if we don't spend, people can't buy, and that means the economy doesn't work, not just that we need to make sure to cut costs and, and uh, have untargeted tax uh, cuts for the wealthy. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And the third uh, final speaker is Mike Intrilligator, who is co-chair of uh, EPS. Uh, among many other titles that he holds. Well, I enjoyed these previous two presentations a lot. They were great. Congratulations, Tom, Heather. Um, in my talk, uh, uh, it's called The Global Recession Continues. This is me, Mike Intrilligator, UCLA Milken Institute, and the Schwartz Symposium. Uh, let me see, how does this work? Oh, here we go. Uh, let me back up. Overview. The current financial, economic, financial and economic crisis is number one. Number two, I want to talk about the mistake of the National Bureau of Economic Research and their dating committee in dating the end of the recession in the U.S. June of last year. This was a huge mistake, in my view, and it gave all the wrong signals to politicians and policymakers and so forth. Number three, it will take years before the current recession will end. I published on this last year, and our predictions are coming exactly right, uh, that I, what I stated last year. Finally, navigating out of the crisis and lessons for the future. So the current crisis began in December of 07, the collapse of subprime mortgages, spread to other areas of the financial system and the overall U.S. economy, and in my view is still here. I'll get back to that later. Uh, this crisis has spread to Europe, Japan, and uh, transition economies, the rest of the world, basically, with devastating effects worldwide. Uh, <clears throat> it affects virtually every country in the world. China is a, a major exception, but the rest of the world is still in the same crisis that we're in. The recent financial um, crises in Greece, huge demonstrations in Athens, also in uh, Brussels, uh, but also the crisis in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and, and other countries as well. Uh, these countries are in deep trouble as we are, in my view. So uh, here we go. Did I skip one? Yeah, OK, mistake in the National Bureau of Economic Research. The National Bureau of Economic Research is a private organization based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they were delegated the responsibility by the US federal government to date the beginning and end of recessions. They've been doing that for many years. And they have a very distinguished group of people who are in charge of that uh, on that committee, the dating committee. And uh, quite recently, on September 20th, they dated the end of the recession as June 2009. But they also cautioned, and people forget this, uh, as an important caution, that this finding bears no relation to the current state of the economy and is not a forecast. They made that extremely clear in their statement uh, dating the end of the recession. But I don't think that that date is correct. I, I find it doubtful, given the continuing high unemployment, now at 9.6%, much higher in other states. In my state of California, we're the third highest unemployment rate after Michigan and Nevada. Continued foreclosures all around the country. Houses are being foreclosed. Bankruptcies, uh, not only corporate bankruptcies, but bank bankruptcies. This is not well known. People see the big banks are doing well. They don't realize the little banks are in deep trouble. Many have gone belly up. Um, personal bankruptcies are enormous. Uh, loss of savings, loss of equity, difficulty in getting credit, particularly for small business. All these things are true, and they continue to be true now, despite what the National Bureau has to say about this. <clears throat> so my view is that we have a continued recession worldwide, except for China. Um, 
Some people ask me, we're going to have a double dip. I say, no, it's not a double dip. It's a single dip. We're still in the single dip. Uh, it's not a double dip, but we're still in deep trouble. Uh, it will take years before the current crisis will end. Uh, in my view, the recession will likely have a U-shape. Uh, this was fashionable uh, a year or so ago to talk about the shape of the reception, whether it's a U, a V, a W, or some a such letter. Uh, my, I'm a U-shaped person uh, with a prolonged downturn rather than a V, uh, wrap it down, wrap it up again. It'll bounce back up again. One of my colleagues at UCLA, Ed Lemer, who runs the Anderson forecast, uh, had this uh, view that it's a V-shape. Uh, we, we've had uh, some arguments about that. And will take perhaps six to eight years to recover from its official start in December 2007. That also comes from the National Bureau of Dating Committee. And that, that date I agree with. It's their ending date that I don't agree with. Uh, the normal recovery forces that we've seen in previous recessions won't work. Fiscal problems of the states, virtually every state, with one, only one or two exceptions, are in deep financial difficulties, particularly my state of California, huge deficits in our state, cutbacks all over the place. My colleagues at the University of California have had to take uh, salary cuts. Uh, we have these uh, days where, uh, where uh, you're not supposed to work and they don't pay you, basically. So we've had these, these cuts. Um, um, banks are not lending, particularly to small business. Big business is a different story, but small businesses, I talk to small business owners, they say they have all kinds of plans. They would love to hire people, put up new buildings or whatever, but they can't get the loans. They, there's no credit available for them. What do they do? Where can they go? It, it's a difficult situation, and of course that feeds the problem. Um, there's no international locomotive of growth. This was a theory we had in previous recessions that if we're in trouble, some other countries will bail us out, whether it's the European Union and Germany in particular, or China, Vietnam, and some other countries, that they would be locomotives of growth, and we would sort of follow that locomotive and come out of the recession. That locomotive doesn't exist anymore, uh, with the exception of China, and they're not going to lead us out of the recession. Uh, they uh, exacerbate the problem, in my view. We can talk about that later. Um, Okay, I published an article in uh, August uh, last year, about a year ago, with Kyle Martin, a colleague, uh, in the Huffington Post called The Rise and Fall of Artificial Wealth. And this was very widely quoted, cited, reproduced an uh, amazing number of places. And here's our prediction. We predicted, we talked about artificial wealth, that particularly housing, equity in, in, in homes, rose to un unbelievable uh, values. And we have to sort of work through that, that problem in the system before we can solve the recession. Our prediction was this. The GDP, would, we realized in 2008, of 14.26 trillion, will not be achieved again on an inflation-adjusted basis until 2013. In other words, the recession didn't end last, June, uh, last year in June. It's going to end in three years' time, 2013. We also predicted that unemployment will not fall back to a level of 6.25%, which we had before the recession was considered a normal value for unemployment. Now it's, of course, 9.6%, uh, uh, higher in other states, uh, until 2016. So we have another three or six years to go before this recession ends, in, mar in, our, in our opinion. And I say this is tracked well. How do we navigate out of the current crisis? What are the lessons for the future? False choice in economic stimulation. I agree with the previous speakers about the need for uh, fiscal stimulus. 